This video is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website and app with a hands-on approach. Check them out at brilliant.org forward slash biographics. More on them in a bit. In the early 17th century, a religious man decided he was going to uncover the architecture of the universe itself. Using observations of the heavens and a deep understanding of geometry, this man conjectured a world of harmonious design where the secrets of God's creation could be deciphered by anyone willing to use mathematics to look for them. In the course of his quest, this man managed to change our understanding of astronomy forever. His name was Johannes Kepler, and he would go down as one of the greatest scientists to ever live. Born into a divided Europe, Kepler grew up in a time of unfathomable change. Witchcraft trials, religious war, and a scientific revolution were all pulling the continent apart. Yet Kepler managed to not just navigate through these changes, but to do so while transforming science. He discovered laws of astronomy, he changed our understanding of optics, pioneered crystallography, developed telescopes, and even wrote what's likely the first work of science fiction. Persecuted for his faith, misunderstood in his lifetime, this is the life of Johannes Kepler, the man who discovered the secrets of the universe. When Johannes Kepler was born in 1571, it was into a Europe already reeling from two major revolutions. Half a century earlier, a man named Martin Luther had nailed his 95 thesis to a church door, kicking off a century and a half of religious upheaval known as the Reformation. 26 years after that, in 1543, the astronomer Nicholas Copernicus had proved that the Sun didn't orbit the Earth, but rather the other way around, triggering an even bigger upheaval known as the Scientific Revolution. By the time Johannes Kepler first opened his eyes, these twin revelations were causing Europe to strain at the seams. Not that Kepler's parents would have imagined that he could have lived long enough to see those seams rip right open. The boy was weak, he was sickly, a prime candidate in those hard times for an early death. And die, he nearly did. Before he was even five, Kepler came down with smallpox, a disease that left his eyesight damaged and his hands unable to properly function. Luckily though, it didn't kill him, and Kepler would live through his illness to see the sight that would change his life. The Great Comet of 1577 was so bright it made the whole of Europe stop and gawp. Up in the Kingdom of Denmark, the astronomer Tycho Brahe, who we're going to meet again in just a moment, watched the comet pass and knew that it would transform his life's work. For young Kepler, though, the Great Comet was even more important. It was this event that would one day make him into an astronomer. But only after some false starts. As a good Lutheran growing up in the Holy Roman Empire, a collection of several hundred states roughly analogous to modern Germany, Kepler wasn't meant to be a mathematician. When he enrolled at the University of Tübingen in 1589, it was on the strict understanding that he would study theology, become a pastor, and help spread Luther's gospel. The fact this didn't happen is due entirely to Michael Maestlin. Maestlin is one of those figures basically no one today can name, but who wound up changing history. Kepler's mathematics tutor, Maestlin was a private devotee of Copernicus. Private, because these were the days when saying the sun didn't orbit the earth could end with the religious authorities using you as an unwilling test subject for their shiny new thumbscrews. But when Maestlin discovered Kepler loved astronomy, he broke cover long enough to lend him Copernicus's De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium Libri V. What Kepler read there blew his mind. In Copernicus's heliocentric universe, Kepler saw not heresy, but the first glimpses of God's harmonious design. For Kepler, this was the road to Damascus moment, the revelation that changed everything. From then on, he devoted his life to studying the stars. It was the start of a journey that would take him not just across the Holy Roman Empire, but into more danger than this sickly teen could have ever believed possible. In 1594, Johannes Kepler received an unexpected letter. Now 23, Kepler was on the verge of graduating university. Despite his devotion to astronomy, he still planned to become a pastor, because that's just what you did in the late 16th century. The letter changed all of that. Sent from the Austrian city of Graz, it invited Kepler to come and work as a maths teacher. And just like that, Kepler was able to throw his boring destiny away and become the mathematician he'd always dreamed of being. Well. Almost. 
Despite what the letter had promised, almost nobody in Graz attended Kepler's classes. He was forced to take a second job as a calendar maker just to survive. But what Kepler's life in Graz lacked in opportunities, success, or happiness, it more than made up for with spare time. Spare time in which Kepler could ponder some of science's most pressing mysteries. Before Copernicus had come along and dynamited thousands of years of human thinking, it was accepted that the planets were fixed to the heavens and that the heavens rotated around the Earth. But now that Copernicus had shown that the Earth was moving around the Sun, all sorts of weird questions had arisen. Clearly, Earth wasn't fixed to anything. It was just kind of floating along. So, well, what made it float? what made the other planets move. It was while daydreaming in one of his near-empty classes in 1595 that Kepler felt a light bulb go ping right above his head. If the planets had a regular orbit around the sun, then surely this was because the sun itself was affecting them with some kind of force. Today, we of course would call that force gravity, but Kepler was living about 50 years before Isaac Newton was even a lustful twinkle in his father's eye, so well, he called it magnetism. Still, it was the very first time anyone in Europe had come even close to understanding what made our solar system tick. But Kepler went even further than just pontificating about the sun. Curious about the space between the planets, he hypothesized that each gap must correspond to one of the platonic solids – the tetrahedron, cube, octahedron, isocahedron, and dodecahedron. When his calculations seemed to bear this out, he declared he had uncovered God's architecture. So this might sound a little cuckoo to modern ears. I mean, magic shapes God's architecture? What? Well, we need to remember the era Kepler was living in. This was an era before pure mathematics, an era in which you could say the sun orbited the earth and not only have people snigger at you, but then have them imprison your neighbor for disagreeing. What Kepler's work did was suggest the universe could be understood through maths, that there was a scientific way of thinking about the heavens beyond simply saying, God did it. It is that simple thought that would turbocharge the scientific revolution. Kepler published his ideas in 1597, the very same year he married his first wife. Not long after, he began writing to Tycho Brahe. Remember Brahe? He was the Danish guy who saw the Great Comet and realized that it would transform his career? Well, Kepler became his pen pal just as Brahe was in the process of moving his work to Prague. It was a relationship that would soon save Kepler's life. In 1599, the religious tensions simmering across Central Europe between Catholics and Lutherans boiled over in Graz. The city's Catholics rioted against attacking Protestants. For the Lutheran Kepler, this was a oh boy, better get out of here moment. The trouble was, he had nowhere to go. His religious buddies back at university had read his book and decided he was a Copernicus-loving heretic who wasn't allowed to hang out with them anymore. Just as it was starting to look like Kepler might find himself being tarred and feathered by angry Catholics, Brahe threw him a lifeline. Hey, I've got a crazy idea, he basically said. Why don't you come work for me in Prague? And that's how, in the dying days of the 16th century, Johannes Kepler found himself joining the legendary court of Rudolf II. But before we get to what he did there, I do want to take a moment to tell you about today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a problem-solving website and app with a hands-on approach. They've got over 60 interactive courses in maths, science, and computer science on their platform. You can use Brilliant to achieve STEM goals. You get one little bit of information and learning at a time. You're going to expand your knowledge of the world through interactive puzzles. Brilliant courses teach you through storytelling, interactive challenges, and problem-solving. Brilliant are always improving their platform, and there's brand new interactive content recently, including updates to their logic course as well well as their course on mathematical fundamentals. Or if you want something completely new, Brilliant have a course all about search engines, which will teach you how search engines like Google work, basically the behind the scenes, how they find the information you need incredibly quickly from the billions of websites out there. Look, Brilliant is a great compliment to watching educational videos like this one, and it will really help explain even complex and technical subjects. So if you want to support biographics and get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's in-depth maths and science courses, head on over to brilliant.org forward slash biographics and get 20% off their annual premium subscription. And let's get back to Kepler. If 
you were alive and into spooky stuff in 1600, there was nowhere better to be than Rudolf II's Prague. The Holy Roman Emperor was obsessed with everything occult. The legendary alchemist John Dee worked for him, as did Rabbi Love, the man said to have created the golem. Not that Rudolf distinguished between crackpot mysticism and actual science, though. He supported alchemists and astrologers, but also astronomers and mathematicians. And one of those astronomers just so happened to be Brahe. Rahe arrived in Prague the year before to take the title of Imperial Mathematician. His mission was to undertake a new set of planetary observations and then create a table from the results that could predict where anything in the night sky would be on a future date. Such tables had existed before, but they'd been plagued by poor data. Brahe was determined to make the most accurate table in history. Unfortunately, history is exactly what Brahe was about to become. On October 24, 1601, Brahe died. Rather than halt his work, Rudolf II simply handed it to Brahe's assistant. This is how Kepler suddenly found himself not just saddled with the title of imperial mathematician and a difficult job to finish, but also with access to the scientific equivalent of magic pixie dust. In his lifetime, Brahe had been a guy who didn't like to share. Among the things he didn't like sharing were his astronomical observations, the most accurate in human history. So when Kepler inherited Brahe's work, he also got his hands on these observations. This data would be the key that helped unlock Kepler's greatest discovery. For the next decade, Kepler slaved away in Prague, making new discoveries like a man possessed. In 1604, for example, his attempt to figure out the best way to observe an eclipse sent him down a rabbit hole that ended in him discovering how light travels through the human eye. Remember in science class when you found out that the human eye actually projects stuff onto your retinas upside down and your brain flips the image the right way up again? Well, Kepler was the first to discover that. He then used this work to design highly improved eyeglasses. The same year he was working on optics, Kepler also became the first to observe what he called a new star in the sky. Actually, we now know that it was the last recorded supernova in the Milky Way. Many years later, Kepler's observation would help him prove that Earth isn't the center of the universe. A few years later, in 1608, he wrote Somnium, or The Dream in English, possibly the first work of science fiction. But it was the book Kepler published in 1609 that really changed the world. Astronomia Nova grew out of Kepler's observation of Mars's orbit. After tracing it through the sky for years, he finally clicked that the complex, twisting trail that we see from Earth is also because Earth is moving through space. By deploying what in the 1600s must have seemed like an insane thought experiment, Kepler managed to show what Earth's own orbit would look like from Mars. From there, it was just a small step to prove that Mars's orbit must be elliptical. It was the first time that anyone had figured out what a planet's orbit actually looked like, and it was from here that Kepler drew his first law that the planets have elliptical orbits with the Sun as one of the foci. It's also from here that he drew the second of his three laws, which is pretty difficult to explain, but basically gives you a way to measure the speed that any planet is traveling around the Sun. As for the third law, well, we'll get back to that in a bit. When Kepler published these findings in Astronomia Nova in 1609, he impressively included all his raw data, today something that's a given where science is concerned. At the time, though, it was almost like a dare for his critics, a way for Kepler to say, you think I'm wrong, do you? Well, study the data and show me where I'm wrong. The Astronomia Nova was a monumental achievement, one that cemented Kepler's claim to greatness. Unfortunately, 1609 was also the moment Kepler's world began to split apart. Back in 1555, the Holy Roman Empire had managed to stop the continent exploding with something called the Peace of Augsburg. After Martin Luther did his thing, the empire had transformed into a gigantic pressure cooker with Catholics and Lutherans threatening to unleash holy war on one another. The peace had released some of that pressure by removing the requirements for states in the empire to be Catholic. Instead, each territory's ruler could choose for themselves whether to be Catholic or Lutheran, and no one else would interfere. But the peace was just a temporary fix, a quick release of some steam. Inside individual states, pressure was still rising as the growing popularity of Protestant Protestantism collided with the often Catholic elite. In Bohemia, the Catholic Rudolf II had tried to solve this by signing the Letter of Majesty. 
An attempt at compromise, it allowed Bohemia's Protestant nobles to build their own churches and worship however they wished. Unfortunately, it was this very act of compromise that would ensure the pressure cooker of Europe finally exploded into the Thirty Years' War. Not that Kepler really noticed any of this. As the new decade dawned, he was still beavering away in Prague, still making discoveries. In 1610, for example, Galileo used the first telescope to discover Jupiter's moons Io, Callisto, Europa, and Ganymede, now known as the Galilean moons. Their existence was such a controversial discovery that most people simply refused to believe it, claiming the telescope must be causing optical illusions. So Kepler sat down and wrote another book on optics, which not only proved Galileo couldn't be seeing things, but also described how to build a vastly more powerful telescope. If it's starting to sound as if Kepler could do just about anything he put his mind to, well, you haven't heard the half of it. The following winter, 1611, he was inspired to do a short study of snowflakes. Not only did he become the first person in history to observe that all snowflakes are unique, the resulting pamphlet has been called the earliest work on crystallography. And if you're feeling like an underachiever right now, well, you're not alone. <laughs> But even as Kepler kept churning out discovery after discovery, storm clouds were gathering on the horizon. The same year that Kepler was writing about snowflakes, Rudolf's younger brother, Matthias, forced the emperor to abdicate at sword point. From the moment he took the throne, the hardcore Catholic Matthias made it clear that he wasn't going to honor any letters giving legal rights to Protestant scum. Suddenly, the Lutheran Kepler was living in a city that officially hated Lutherans. It was Graz 2.0, and once again, Kepler had no way out. As 1612 got underway, Kepler began searching frantically for an exit from Prague. He wrote again to his old university, but they were like, Dude, you wrote that the Earth orbits the Sun. That's crazy. If we hire you, people are going to think we're crazy, right? If that wasn't bad enough, that same year, Kepler's wife died of spotted fever. Just as Kepler was getting desperate, the city of Linz came to his rescue. They would create the position of district mathematician just for him, provided he used his time in the city to finish Brahe's tables. With no other options, Kepler accepted. He got out just in time. Five years later, in 1617, Prague cracked down hard on its Protestants. The churches opened under Rudolf II and were closed. Non-Catholics were subjected to harassment. For a year, the Protestants tried to put up with these indignities. Then, in 1618, they finally snapped. On May the 23rd, a group of Protestants stormed Prague Castle, grabbed three Catholics, and hurled them out of a high window. The defenestration of Prague is famous today not for its death toll – all three Catholics survived after landing in a pile of manure – but it's famous for what it started. The defenestration was the opening salvo in the Thirty Years' War, three decades of religious violence that would destroy Central Europe and leave over eight million people dead. And Johannes Kepler was about to get caught right in the middle of it. If we were to try and explain the Thirty Years' War, it would take about, well, 30 years and leave us all with really sore brains. To put it in its crudest terms, just know that it was a religious war that quickly grew beyond religion and would ultimately involve not just the many states of the Holy Roman Empire, but also France, Spain, Sweden, the Netherlands, Poland, the Ottoman Empire, the Habsburg lands, England, Scotland, Russia, and pretty much any nation that happened to be passing by and felt like joining in the Royal Rumble. Oh, and because the war was so big, so long, and so vicious, it also created the ideal conditions for the outbreak of a plague, which in turn created the ideal conditions for witchcraft panics, which in turn led to some of the largest mass executions for witchcraft in human history. So yeah, Thirty Years' War, not exactly a fun time to be alive in Central Europe. Sadly though, Central Europe was exactly where Kepler was. By 1619, Linz, like Graz and Prague before, it was paralyzed by anti-Protestant riots. As a guest of the city, Kepler was allowed to stay, and he and his new family had married local lass Susan Rutinger soon after arriving in 1613, and now they had three children, they were officially protected. But unofficially, unofficially, the family had to deal with prejudice every single day. In such circumstances, it's almost a wonder that Kepler got any work done at all. Yet somehow, he managed. That same year, Kepler published his third law, which states that squaring the length of any planet's orbit, in other words, the length of its year, and dividing that by its distance from the sun cubed will return a constant number. It was a powerful mathematical insight, but it was also overshadowed by events in Kepler's life. 
Remember the book Somnium that Kepler published back in 1608, the one we said might be their first work of science fiction? Well, we didn't mention it at the time, but Somnium includes a little side story, one about a son who is a scientist and a mother who is a witch. In 1620, life began imitating Kepler's art in the darkest possible way. That year, Kepler's own mother was imprisoned for witchcraft. Witchcraft accusations during the Thirty Years' War, certainly not something to be taken lightly. This was the same era as the Würzburg witch trials in which hundreds of people were burned at the stake. Kepler knew he had to save his mother, so he dropped what he was doing and returned at once to organize her defense. The resulting trial would eat up over a year of his life. To hear the story now is actually all sorts of impressive. Kepler approached the case like he did his scientific work, using a deep analysis of the raw documents to forensically examine the prosecution's claims. It was a battle between science and superstition, a case in which one side used rational arguments, while the other talked about demons and women turning themselves into cats. Incredibly, science actually won. After 14 months manacled in a cell, the threat of torture looming over her, Kepler's mother was set free, thanks entirely to her son's efforts. For Kepler, heck, for rationality, this was a huge victory, but it was one that came at a price. For over a year, Kepler's scientific work had been put on hold. The trial had also left him in dire need of money, money the city of Linz wasn't willing to pay. Not long after the trial ended, Kepler's Linz home was requisitioned and turned into a troop garrison. In 1625, the Catholics running the city confiscated his entire library and forced his children to start attending mass. Finally, in 1626, Kepler and his family they left Linz for good. But now they were broke and on the verge of destitution. Ever the optimist, Kepler tried heading back to Prague and asking the treasury for unpaid wages that Rudolf II had owed him, but they simply laughed him out of the city. It was a bleak time, not just for Kepler, but for the whole of Europe. But the astronomer wasn't done yet. He still had one last moment of greatness to come. It had been 1599 when Rudolf II first called Brahe to his court to prepare new astronomical tables. This was years before Kepler described his three laws, years before his discovery of Mars's orbit, before the defenestration of Prague, before the Thirty Years' War. In that time, Brahe and Rudolf had both died, and the continent had split apart. But Kepler hadn't forgotten what he was meant to be doing. He hadn't forgotten the promise that he had made so long ago. In 1627, Kepler finally published Brahe's finished tables. Known today as the Rudolphine Tables, they were the most accurate tables for predicting the movement of the planets in human history. They were based not just on Brahe's jealously guarded data, but also on Kepler's own observations. In fact, his three laws were baked into the tables, underlying every calculation that Kepler had performed. If his laws were real, the predictions in the tables would be borne out, and luckily there was a major one coming up that everyone could check them against. In 1630, Mercury was scheduled to transit across the Sun. Sadly for our story, Kepler wouldn't live to see himself vindicated. On November 15, 1630, Johannes Kepler passed away in the city of Regensburg. Around him, the Thirty Years' War it continued to rage, a pointless howl of destruction consuming Europe. Even in death, Kepler wouldn't escape it. At some point, a rampaging army destroyed the cemetery he was buried in. The location of his body is now lost to history. But even as Europe tore itself apart, the first rays of hope were beginning to glimmer. In 1631, Mercury completed its transit across the Sun, exactly as Kepler's tables had predicted. With Kepler's work clearly on the mark, it started raising questions, one of which would eventually come to greatly trouble a young British man. About 50 years later, long after the Thirty Years' War had finally ended, Isaac Newton found himself pondering Kepler's tables. If it were possible to predict the movements of the planet so accurately, there must be some sort of force guiding them. Newton disagreed with Kepler's theory about a magnetic sun, so he set about discovering just what this mysterious force might be. From these musings would come the discovery of gravity. But while his influence on Newton may be Kepler's biggest claim to fame, there are other ways that his work lasted. Just take a look at Kepler's conjecture, a 1611 theory on the stacking of cannonballs that wasn't proved until 1998, nearly 400 years later. But perhaps the most important aspect of Kepler's work is the thinking that underlay it all. Kepler was one of the first to look at the night sky and not see some unknowable mechanism at work, but a divine plan that was both beautiful and capable of being understood by humans. While Kepler may have been more explicitly religious than most scientists today, he even actually referred to himself as a prophet at one point, that idea of a universal language, of an existence we can understand through mathematics, is still very relevant. 
Kepler may have died before he could see his life's work be proved right, but his name will continue to echo across history for centuries to come. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Do not forget to subscribe. Brand new videos four days a week. Also, why not check out another channel I do? It's called Highlight History. It's sort of a today in history thing. I'm going to link to that below. And as always, thank you for watching.